Good day to all of you. So we're already on chapter 11, all about mass storage systems. So last topic or last lesson, we've learned all about the virtual memory, which is part of the memory management. So this chapter 11 is already included in the part of storage management. So let's learn all about the storage or the mass storage system. So let's start our lesson. So again, chapter 11 is all about mass storage systems. So what are the contents of this chapter? So these are overview of mass storage structure, HDD or hard disk drive scheduling. We have NVM scheduling or non-volatile memory scheduling. Next is we have the error detection and correction, storage device management, swap space management, storage attachment, and RAID structure. So the following are the objectives of this chapter. So first is describe the physical structure of secondary storage devices and the effect of a device structure on its uses. Explain the performance characteristics of mass storage devices. Next is evaluate input-output or I/O scheduling algorithms. Discuss operating system services provided for mass storage, including RAID or redundant array of independent disks. We're going to tackle that later. So first is we have the overview of mass storage structure. So meaning mass, of course, it's large storage structure. So bulk, so that's why, as I've said, it's uh, the capacity is larger than the um, main memory. So bulk of secondary storage for modern computers is hard disk drives, as I've said, or the HDDs and non-volatile memory NVM devices. So HDDs is pin platters of magnetically coated material under moving read-write heads, and then drives rotate at 60 to 250 times per second. So the transfer rate is the rate at which data flow between drive and computer. So we have the following definitions, positioning time, or it's also called random access time. It's time to move disk arm to the desired cylinder. So that, uh, that time to move disk arm to the desired cylinder is the seek time. And time for desired sector to rotate under the disk head. So that uh, definition is all about the rotational latency. So positional, positioning time is a combination of seek time and rotational latency. So head crash results from disk head making contact with the disk surface. So that's bad. Why? Head crash meaning, as it is said, that um, uh, hard disk drives are reading data by means of uh, magnetism. So, it means that it does not have any contact on the surface of the hard disk drive. So, this head crash meaning um, it has so, at some point in time, there's a contact, of course, of uh, the, the read-write arm in the sur uh, to, uh, to the surface of the hard disk drive. And it actually, it will create a damage. So, that's why it's called a head crash. And then, it results of a bad sector. So, that's why it is um it's that's uh that's bad so also for to to avoid head crash so for example your you have a um desktop pc so it's uh, it should you should not put your system unit under the table because it is prone for movements such as um of course um uh, deliberately you you kick and uh, not deliberately or um uh, of course, it is prone with kicking. Of course, uh, our feet is under the table. And then if your system unit is under the table, so it, it will have an effect on your hard drive. And at the same time, for your laptops, for example, you are traveling. So as much as possible, if you are traveling, you have to make sure that your um, uh, laptops or notebooks are properly shut down. Because if it's, uh, for example, um, you're going to travel and then you just, close the lid of your laptop so of course the hard disk drive is still working there what if for example you have uh, I, I hope that it won't happen for example an accident of course uh, it will also damage your hard disk drive actually if there is an accident uh, it will not 
even if your uh, laptop or notebook is uh, properly shut down, it will be also be destroyed because of impact. But then again, as I've said, head crash happens when there is a contact on the surface of the hard disk drive and the read right arm. So it's bad because it will produce bad sectors. So bad sectors actually will already be a space unusable for your computer. And then uh, next continue. Then there are disks that can be removable. Uh, what is what is an example? Of course, uh, I don't know if your laptops have still the DVD, DVD ROM, so the drive. So of course, um, if you're going to open, so for you to use that, you should have a medium, uh, a DVD on or a CD. So that's why there are disks that, that can be removable. So this is an illustration of the uh, moving head disk mechanism. So conceptually, HDDs are relatively simple. So each disk platter, so these are the um, platters, so has a flat circular shape like a CD. So common platter diameters range from 1.8 to 3.5 inches. So the two surfaces of a platter are covered with the magnetic material. So we store information by recording it magnetically. So as I've said, there is no physical contact between the arm and the surface of the hard drive. And the, uh, on the platters, and we read information by detecting the magnetic pattern of, on the platters. So that is the description for this figure. Okay, so specifically, we have hard disk drives. So, platters range from 0.85 to 14 inch historically. And then, commonly now, it's 3.5 inch, 2.5, and 1.8. So, of course, uh, the, small, the smaller dimensions are used for um, laptops and notebooks. And then, range from 30 gig to 3 terabyte per drive. So, currently, as of now, uh, the av available in the market is terabyte okay what is the performance of the hard disk drive so in terms of transfer rate it's theoretical we have six gigabits per second second rather and then we also have the effective transfer rate which is also the real because transfer rate is uh, theoretical so we have one gigabit per second sick time is from three milliseconds to 12 milliseconds so, 9 milliseconds common for desktop drives. And then the average sick time measured or calculated based on one-third of checks. So, latency based on spindle speed is we have 1 over RPM or revolutions per minute divided by 60 or equivalent to 60 divided by RPM. And average latency is one-half latency. So next is we have the hard disk performance. So access latency is equal to average access time, which is equal to the formula average sick time plus average latency. So for fastest disk, we have 3 milliseconds plus 2 milliseconds is equals uh, 5 milliseconds. And then for slow disk, we have 9 milliseconds plus 5.56 milliseconds is equal to 14.56 milliseconds. So we also have the average IO time. So it is equal to average access plus amount to transfer divided by the transfer rate. So it's quantity. So you have to divide first the amount to transfer and transfer rate and then add controller overhead. So we have an example here. So to transfer a 4 kilobyte block on a 7,200 RPM disk with a 5 millisecond average sick time. So 1 gigabit per second transfer rate with a 0 0.1 millisecond control overhead. So we have 5 milliseconds, which is the average sick time plus 4.17. So 4.17 comes from the um, amount to transfer divided by transfer time plus 0 0.1. So, we have the controller overhead plus transfer time is equal to. So, let's just transfer the values to the, um, to the right and then um, transfer time will be left 
of course, on the left side. So, transfer time is equal to 4 kilobyte divided by 1 gigabits per second times 8 gigabit divided by gigabyte times 1 gigabyte divided by 1024 squared kilobyte. So, is equal to 32 divided by 1024 squared is equal to 0 0.31 milliseconds. So, the average I.O. time for 4 kilobyte block is equal to 9.27 milliseconds plus 0 0.31 milliseconds is equal to 9.301 milliseconds. So, this is an example for the hard disk performance. So, next is we have the first commercial disk drive. So, in 1956, IBM RAM DAC computer included the IBM model 350 disk storage system. So, we have 5 megabit or megabyte, 7 bit characters, so 50 times 24 inch platters, so 24 inch, so two rulers. Access time, as you can see, this is the hard, this is already the hard drive in 1956. It's almost uh, as large as a refrigerator times two, two refrigerators. So access time is equal to less than one second. So... Uh, very, um, it's amazing that this is a hard drive compared now that it's very thin. So, of course, uh, which is more powerful, of course, the hard disk drives now are more powerful than the first commercial disk drive, um, even though it's large. Okay, next, we are already finished with hard disk drive. Next is we have non-volatile memory or NVM devices. So, if disk drive-like, then called solid-state disks or SSDs, actually, this is, these are already very popular nowadays. So, that's why laptops, which are relatively thin, which are, which are new, uh, most of them are already SSD. As you can see, uh, the prices, uh, actually, the, the, the price is relatively too high or uh, higher than the usual hard disk drive but of course it pays off because ssd as you can see later on it is faster than using the hard disk drive okay so other forms include so so solid state disk is disk drive like but uh, nvm can also uh, come in forms of a usb drive so it may be a thumb drive or flash drive dram disk replacements surface mounted on motherboards and main storage in devices like smartphones can be more reliable than HDDs because, of course, the access time is faster because there is no rotation of, uh, no spinning of platters and there is no read-write head. And then more expensive per megabyte, of course. So, yeah, if you can research on the market, the, the price is always higher for SSD. It's just because it is uh, faster. It has faster response if you installed, if your hard, uh, if your disk drive is an uh, SSD. So maybe have a shorter lifespan. So need careful management. So uh, how, how why is this the case? So you can learn later why why it has a shorter lifespan, and then of course less capacity because it's a newer technology compared with. This drive, which is the maximum capacity, is we have um, three terabytes for for this presentation. But in our, in here in the Philippines, it's still two terabytes. And then for um, for SSD, is we have five hundred gigabyte. I don't know if it if it already has one terabyte, but of course it's expensive. Uh, one terabyte of SSD compared to one terabyte of hard disk drive, it is more expensive of course as i've said it is much faster and then buses can be too slow so to connect ssd we can connect it directly for pci for example and then no moving parts so no sick time or rotational latencies as i've said there are no spinning platters and there is no read write head in which are they're going to seek the data in the specific platter that is spinning Okay, so for NVM devices have characteristics that present challenges. So what are these challenges? So we have read and written in page increments or the thick sector but can't overwrite in place. So what happens is that must first be erased 
and erases happen in larger block increments. So the uh, the first challenge here is that can only be erased a limited number of times before worn out. So actually, all of the all of the devices worn out over time, especially if they are mechanical. But for NVM, um, if the block is always erased, so approximately uh, the number of times that you can erase a certain block is we have 100,000 um, times. So lifespan measured in drive rights per day or WPD. So WPD, so a one terabyte non-drive with a rating of five drive rights per day is expected to have five terabytes per day written within warranty period without failing okay next is we have the non-flash controller algorithms so with no overwrite pages end up with mix of valid and invalid data so that that will be the challenge because if you can be erased so the old data will not be accessed anymore but because for this uh, ssd there there is no overwrite so there is a possibility of mix of valid and invalid data so to track with logical blocks which logical blocks are valid controller maintains flash translation layer or the ftl table this also implements garbage collection to free invalid page space and then allocates over provisioning to provide working space for garbage collection so what is over provisioning so the device set aside a number of pages so frequently 20% of the total as an area always available to write to. So each cell has a lifespan. So wear leveling needed to write equally to all cells. So what is wear leveling? So if some blocks are erased repeatedly while others are not, so the frequently erased blocks will wear out faster than the others and the entire device will have a shorter lifespan than it would if all blocks were were out concurrently so that is why we're leveling so as much as possible you should not um, erase uh, blocks uh, repeatedly so this uh, uh, erasing of uh, blocks should be uniformly distributed so that particular part which is always erased repeatedly it will be it will be worn out and the problem is uh, the the number of years that your um, uh, SSD will will be functional, will be lessened. So this is an example of a non-block with valid and invalid pages. So because um, non-block uh, does not have any um, overwrite. Okay, next is we have volatile memory. So DRAM frequently used as, as a mass storage device. So not technically secondary storage because also DRAM can also store um, uh, big amounts of data. So of course, it's not a technically secondary storage because it's volatile. Again, the term volatile, if power source is cut down from the DRAM, then the data that it stores will also, it will evap. evap. It's like, it's like uh, the, the, the notion there is it will, the data will evaporate too. So that's why the term is volatile. But can have file systems be used like very fast secondary storage. So for volatile memory, there is also a drive that existed such as the RAM drives. So with many names including RAM, disks. So present as raw block devices commonly file system formatted. So computers have buffering, caching via RAM. So why RAM drives? So these are the reasons. So cache the caches or buffers allocated are managed by the programmer, operating system, and hardware. And then RAM drives under user control. And it is also found in all major operating systems, such as for Linux, it can be found using the, the path slash dev slash RAM, Mac OS disk util to create them, Linux slash TMP of file system type TMPFS. So volatile memory is also used as high speed temporary storage. So programs could share bulk data quickly by reading or writing to RAM drive.
Okay, next is we have the magnetic tape. So, let this, uh, let me allow to read the text. So, magnetic tape was used as an early secondary storage medium. Although it is non-volatile and can hold large quantities of data, its access time is slow compared with that of main memory and, and drives. In addition, random access to magnetic tape is about a thousand times slower than random access to hard disk drives and about a hundred times slower than random access to SSD. So tapes are not very useful for secondary storage. Actually, these are used for backup. So tapes are used mainly for backup, as I've said, for storage of infrequently used information and as a medium for transferring information from one system to another. So a tape is kept in a spool and is wound or rewound past a read-write head. Moving to the correct spot on a tape can take minutes. But once positioned, tape drives can read and write data at speeds comparable to HDDs. Of course, the transfer rate is just the same with hard disk drive as long as the, the, pos the, the right position to transfer data is already met. So tape capacities vary greatly depending on the particular kind of tape drive with current capacities exceeding several terabytes. So some tapes have built-in compression that can more than do double the effective storage. So tapes and their drivers are usually categorized by width including the 4, 8, and 19 millimeters and 1 fourth and 1 half inch. Some are named according to technology such as the LT06 and SDLT. So for this figure, so we have an LT06 tape drive with tape cartridge inserted. So again, magnetic drives is very slow. So that's why it is only mainly used for backup. Okay, next is we have disk attachment. So, host-attached storage access through I.O. ports talking to I.O. buses. So, several buses available including the Advanced Technology Attachment or the ATA. So, there is also another which is the Parallel. So, this is an old uh, um, buses for old computers. So, next is uh, sometimes it's called Ribbon if I'm not mistaken. So, we have serial ATA or the SATA, and then we have the eSATA, the serial attached uh, SCSI or SAS, and then universal serial bus or the USB, of course, and we have the fiber channel FC. So, most commonly used now, until now, is we have SATA. So, because NVM or non-volatile memory much faster than hard disk drives, new interface for NVM called NVM Express or NVMe connecting directly to PCI bus. And then data transfers on a bus carried out by special electronic processors are uh, called controllers or host bus, bus, bus adapters or HBAs. So, host controller in the computer end of the bus device controller on the device end and then computer places command on host controller using memory mapped IO ports and then the host controller sends messages to device controller and then data transferred via DMA between device and computer DRAM. So next is we have address mapping. So these drives are addressed as large one-dimensional arrays of logical blocks where the logical block is the smallest unit of transfer. So low-level formatting creates logical blocks on physical media. So the one-dimensional array of logical blocks is mapped into the sectors of the disk sequentially. So sector 0 is the first sector of the first track on the outmost cylinder. Then mapping proceeds in order through that track. Then the rest of the tracks in that cylinder. And then through the rest of the cylinders from outermost to innermost and then next is we have logical to physical address should be easy so except again for bad sectors because um what they're uh, the hardest uh, what what is the hardest doing for example if there are bad sectors so it will be skipped and it will of course since it's a bad sector it's bad to put data in a bad sector so you have to skip and avoid bad sectors so non-constant number con uh, number rather non-constant number of sectors per track via constant angular velocity. 
Okay, next is we have HDD scheduling. So the operating system is responsible for using hardware efficiently for the disk drives. This means having a fast access time and disk bandwidth. So for scheduling, we should minimize the seek time. So seek time is equivalent to seek distance. So the definition of disk bandwidth is the total number of bytes transferred divided by the total time between the first request for service and the completion of the last transfer. So next is we have, of course, the HDD scheduling. So there are many sources of disk I.O. request. Uh, it can come from the OS, system processes, and users processes. So I.O. requests include input or output mode, disk address, memory address, number of sectors to transfer. OS maintains queue of requests per disk or device. Idle disk can immediately work on I.O. request. Busy disk means work must queue. And then there are optimization algorithms only make sense when a queue exists. So in the past, operating system responsible for queue management, disk drive head scheduling. So now, built onto the storage devices and on controllers, just provide LBA. So LBA is logical block address, handle sorting of requests. And then some of the algorithms they use are described next. So we have this example. So note that drive controllers have small buffers and can manage a queue of I.O. requests of varying depth. So several algorithms exist to schedule the servicing disk IO request of uh, uh, servicing of disk IO requests. So the analysis is true for one or many platters. So illustrate the scheduling algorithms with a request queue from 0 to 199. So this is the uh, value and then the head pointer is in 53. Okay, the first disk scheduling algorithm is the FCFS. So just like with CPU scheduling algorithm, FCFS means first come, first serve. So it says here that illustration shows the total head movement of 640 cylinders. So how does this 640 cylinders computed? So let me show you. So we have the queue. So it is already given and then head starts at 53. Of course, if we're going to create the disk scheduling algorithm um, like, like a graph. So you have to map. So from 0 to 199 and then map uh, in order of magnitude. So we have the, the values of 14, then 37, 53. 65, 67, 98, 122, and 124, then 183. So it should be in sequence. From the smallest, from the left going to the right, which is the right, is the uh, biggest value. And then our starting point is we have um, 53. So to calculate the total head movements, the technique here is, for example, um, of course, this is first come, first serve. So you're going to graph. So from 53 going to 98 and then 183. And then next is going to 37. And then we have 122. And then we have 14. And then 124. And then going to 65. And then the last stop is in 67. Okay, so we've already, so for this example, this is already the graph that is created. So for you to calculate the total head movement is uh, for this example is you have two uh, so that will not be mistaken. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have seven lines meaning um, you will add seven values to get the total head movement. So let's start with okay let's start with this line. So this line is 183 minus 53. So 183 minus 53 is what? So we have 130. Okay, next is this line, 183 minus 37. So 183 minus 37 is we have 146. Okay. 
Next line is we have 122 minus 37. So 122 minus 37 is we have 85. Okay. Next line is we have the fourth is we have 122 minus 14. So 122 minus 14 is we have 100. Okay, we have 108. Okay, so this is the fourth line. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So next line will be 124 minus 14. So 124 minus 14 is we have 100. 10. Okay, next is we have 124 minus 65. So 124 minus 65 is we have 59. Okay, and last but not the least is we have 67 minus 65, which is equal to 2. Again, we have for the first line, 130, then next is 146, 85, 108, 110, 59, and 2. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 lines. So, total. So, let's add. Okay, let's add. So, 6 plus 5 is 11, plus 18, 19, plus 9 is we have 28, plus 2 is we have 30, then carry 3. Okay. 3 plus 3, 6, plus 4, 10, plus 8, 18, plus 1, we have uh, 19, plus 5 is we have 24, okay, carry to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's why we have a total of 640 cylinder. That's how you're going to compute the total head movement. You have to um, add the uh, distances of the lines. Okay, so that is for the FCFS. Okay, next is we have the scan. So the disc arm starts at one end of the disc and moves toward the other end, servicing requests until it gets to the other end of the disc where the head movement is reversed and servicing continues. So, scan algorithm is sometimes called the elevator algorithm. So, the illustration shows total head movements of 236 cylinders. So, I'm going to illustrate it again. So, how, how come it became 236 cylinders? But note that if requests are uniformly dense, largest density at the other end of disk and those wait the longest. So, this is an example or the, the graph for the disk scheduling. So, again, we have the Q here. Unlike with first come, first serve, whatever the arrangement or the order of the values, it will be served. While uh, for scan, is we have a starting point, which is 53. And then, of course, the description of scan is it will uh, go to the end of the, uh, for the disk. Since it is nearer to uh, uh, it is nearer going to zero, so what will it do is from 53, then you're going to have uh, again you're going to do the uh, the mapping from zero to 199, then 37, then going to 14, and then going to zero. Though zero is not included for scan, it will go to the end of the disk, as it is said here, uh, one end of the disk, and then after that. It will continue since 37 and 14 is already uh, finished um, servicing the request. Next is we have, okay, uh, from the order of uh, from uh, small value to large value. So next is we have 65 and then 67. And then next is we have 98. And then we have 122, 124. And the last uh, stop or for the end of the, uh, for the disk is 100. 83. So, uh, how are you going to compute since the total number of cylinders is 236 that it is indicated in the previous slide? So, what you're going to do here is count the number of uh, lines. So, some other in the tutorials, they really 
subtract from, for example, 65 to 60. For example, 65 minus uh, 0 or 122 minus 67. So actually, what you're going to do here is just since this line from going to 0 to 183 is a uh, continuous line considered it as one line so 183 minus 0 is we have 183 okay and then next is we have 53 minus 0 is still 53 so if you're going to compute it so 3 plus 3 is equal to 6 and then 8 plus 5 is equal to 13 and then carry 1, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. So, the total number of uh, uh, total head movement is 236 cylinders. So, that is scan. So, as you can see, which is better if compared with first come, first served, of course, scan is better because it only has 236 total head movements compared with FCFS, which is 640 um, total head movement, 640 cylinders. So that is a scan. Next is we have C scan. So C scan is provide a more uniform wait time than S scan. So it's like C circular scan. So the head moves from one end of the disk to the other, servicing requests as it goes. And then when it reaches the other end, however, it immediately returns to the beginning of the disk without servicing any request on the return trip. So it treats the cylinders as circular, so that's why it's called C-scan. So circular list that wraps around from the last cylind cylinder to the first one. So what are the total number of cylinders? So we have this one. So actually for scan and C-scan, it's very important the direction of uh, where your uh, read and write um, arm will go so i'll provide an additional tutorial for this one that it has a given um direction of where to go so for c scan so uh, assuming that direction is uh, from smaller to larger um value and then for of course for scan is of course since zero is meter so that so that it, it goes to the left Okay, so we have for C scan, so this is the sequence, and then head starts at 53. So we have from 53, then 65, 67, 98, 122, 124, then 183. Then supposedly 183 is the biggest number, but since for circular scan, it will uh, proceed to the end of the disk, and then after that is it will. Uh, it, uh, it will go to the other end of the disk without servicing any. So that's why it's called circular or C-scan. And then next is um, service the other, uh, the two that is left, which is 14 and 37. So if we're going to um, add the total number, so we have 199 minus 53. So again, since this line is continuous, you can... Um, compute it as one line instead of example again 122 minus 67 so just one since this is continuous you can compute it as one so we have 199 minus 53 is we have 146 and then since this is 199 minus 0 it's still 199 Okay, then next is we have, okay, then we have 37, then we have 0. So, 37 minus 0 is still 37. So, we have 6 plus 9 is we have 15. 15 plus 7 is we have 22. Okay, carry 2. 2 plus 4, 6 plus 9, um, 15 plus 3 is we have 18. Carry 1, so we have 1, 2, 3, so we have a total of uh, 382 cylinders for total head movements for C-scan. So for comparison, 
FCFS, SCAN, and C-SCAN. For this example, which of them has the um, um, shortest or at least number of total head movements? Of course, it is SCAN. So, selecting a disk scheduling algorithm. So, actually, in this um, content, we have this SSTF. So, shortest seek time first is common and has a natural appeal. But as you can see, I've only demonstrated first come, first serve scan and C-scan because as of this date, um, this is uh, these are the three most common disk scheduling algorithm. For SSTF, so you're going, for example, your head is starts at 53. So it will have an overhead to predict which of the of the next values is nearer uh, the uh, the nearer fr from the fifth from the value 53 so uh, the problem is that with SSTF is throughput um, increases so next is we have C scan and C scan perform better for systems that place a heavy load on the disk so less starvation but still possible and then to avoid starvation, Linux implements the deadline scheduler. So it maintains separate read and write queues, gives a read a priority. So because processes more likely to block on read than write, then implements four queues, two for read and two for write, write, and then one read and one write queue sorted in LBA order. So essentially implementing C scan. So again, LBA means logical block address. So one read and one write queue sorted in FCFS order. And then all IO requests set, sent in batch sorted in that queue's order. And then after each batch, checks if any request in FCFS older than configured age. Default is 500 milliseconds. So if so, LBA queue containing that request is selected for next batch of input output. So, in RHEL 7, also NOOP and Completely Fair Scheduler or CFQ also available. Defaults vary by storage device. So, what is NOOP or NOOP? So, the Linux NVM scheduling algorithm. So, FCFS but with adjacent requests to merge into fewer larger I.O. requests. So, that is the definition of NOOP while Completely Fair Queuing rather Scheduler or CFQ is in Linux, the default I.O. scheduler in kernel 2.6 and later versions. Okay, next is we have NVM scheduling, so non-volatile memory scheduling. So, no disk heads or rotational latency, but still room for optimization. So, in RHEL 7 again, so nope, there is no scheduling is used, but adjacent LBA requests are combined. So, NVM best at random I.O., so HDD at sequential, and then throughput can be similar. And then we have the input-output operations per seconds or IOPS much higher with NVM or hundreds of thousands versus hundreds. So, what is IOPS or IOPS? So, a measure of random access I.O. performance, the number of inputs-outputs per second. And then we also have the write amplification. So, but write amplification, one write causing garbage collection and many read or writes can decrease the performance advantage. So, write amplification is the creation of I.O. request not by application but by NVM devices doing garbage collection and space management potentially impacting the device write performance. Okay, next is we have the Error detection and correction. So fundamental aspect of many parts of computing, so from memory to networking and storage. So error detection determines if there is a problem that has occurred, for example, a bit flipping. So if detected, can halt the operation. Detection frequently done via the parity bit. So parity one form of checksum. So checksum is any mechanism to check errors. So... Uses modular arithmetic to compute, store, compare values of fixed length words. And another detection method common in networking is the cyclic redundancy check or the CRC. 
which uses hash function to detect multiple bit errors for networking because for networking there's a transfer of data sometimes since it's the travel transfer of data it's very lucky if you only have one bit that is flipped what if there is a combination of bits that has altered while transferring in 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 networks and then next is we have the error correction code or the ECC not only detects so cyclic redundancy check is error detection but for error correction code of course it's not only detection but can correct some errors so soft errors are correctable or can be corrected while hard errors detected but they are not corrected so next is we have storage device management so low level formatting or physical formatting dividing a disk into sectors that the disk controller can read and write so each sector can hold header information plus data plus error correction code so usually it is 512 bytes of data but can be selectable so to use a disk to hold files the operating system still needs to record its own data structures on the disk so that's why so if you're ha if you have a new hard disk drive you cannot use it immediately you have to format it because if you will not format it it's a raw disk then of course the hard drive uh, cannot access the disk because it does not have any file system yet okay next is we have for the uh, formatting so we have the partition the disk into one or more groups of cylinders each treated as a logical disk so for example for a hard drive a partition of course that's why it's called a partition so you really have one disk drive that is physically available in your computer system but why are you seeing it as four uh, hard disk drives it's because um these four hard disk hard disk drives that you are seeing these are logical disk it looks uh, um you can imagine hard disk drive is a house and then you divided it into living room dining room um of course the bedroom and and the like so if you're going to view it as logical you can see you can count how many rooms it's like the the partition is like a room but of course physically for hard disk drive there's only one physical hard the hard disk drive with four partitions in my example and then logical formatting or making a file system and then to increase efficiency most file system group blocks into clusters so because disk io done in blocks and then file io is done in clusters okay next is we have root partition contains the os other partitions can hold other oss other file systems or bureau so the meaning of root partition it means it contains the operating system so let's have an illustration here so this is for the um, folder so as you can see i have four drives of course one of it is um a dvd drive and then we have c d and f so this is the root partition because we have the logo here of windows which means that the os is uh is situated there so that is the root partition okay let's go back so these partitions are mounted at boot time of, of course so that uh, the o, uh, the OS can be loaded into memory. Other partitions can mount automatically or manually. But for example, in Windows case, um, the partitions are automatically mounted. And then at mount time, file system consistency check. So is all metadata correct? If not, fix it and then try again. If yes, add to mount table and allow access. Then boot block can point to boot volume or bootloader set of blocks that contain enough code to know how to load the kernel from the file system or a boot management program for multi-OS booting. So example of a boot management program is we have the grub. Uh, this is used for dual boot of um, Windows and Linux. Okay, next is we have 
raw disk as access for apps that want to do their own block management keep os out of the way for example of these apps are databases and then boot block initializes the system so the bootstrap is stored in rom and firmware or firmware and then bootstrap loader program stored in boot blocks of boot partition so we have an example here so booting from secondary storage in windows so we have the mbr or the master boot record so it contains the boot code and partition table so you have to be very careful with mbr so sometimes there are viruses that are targeting this mbr so the consequences if mbr is corrupted you cannot use your computer or your personal computer so you have to be very careful with mbr because again this contains the boot code in the partition table as you can see we have an example from partition one to four sometimes the first partition is to where windows will be installed but for this example um it seems that the boot partition is in partition number three based on the partition table actually there is no problem as long as the partition table here points to the correct partition where the os is installed okay next is we have the methods such as sector sparing used to handle bad blocks so what is sector sparing so the replacement of unusable of an unusable HD sector with another sector at some other location of the device. Okay, next is we have the swap space management. So used for moving entire processes, swapping or pages, which is paging, from DRAM to secondary storage when DRAM not large enough for all processes. Of course, uh, we have this swap space management. So, operating system provides the so-called, of course, the swap space management. Secondary storage is lower than DRAM, so important to optimize performance. Uh, usually, multiple swap spaces possible, decreasing I.O. load on any given device. Best to have dedicated devices. Can be in raw partition or a file within a file system for convenience of adding. So, again, swap space management. Low-level OS task of managing space on secondary storage for use in swapping and paging. So, this is the data structure for swapping in on Linux system. So, we have this. This is the swap area and then the swap partition or the swap file and then the swap map. So, for example, uh, if there need to be swap, of course, there is a corresponding... Um, space for of course for the swap space management okay next is we have the storage attachment so computers access storage in three ways we have the host attached network attached and cloud so host attached access through local io ports using one of several technologies so to attach many devices use storage buses such as usb Firewire, so Firewire is developed by Apple, but of course, uh, most specifically, these are uh, these are for uh, Apple devices. And we have Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is um, created by Intel. But of course, as you can see, USB interface is used rather than this firewall, firewall, firewire rather, and Thunderbolt. And then we have high-end systems use fiber channel. So what is fiber channel? So a type of storage I.O. bus used in data centers to connect computers to storage arrays. Okay, so it has a high-speed serial architecture using fiber or copper cable. So that's why it's called a fiber channel. Multiple hosts and storage devices can connect to the FC fabric. So next is we have the network attached storage or NAS. So NAS is a storage made available over a network rather than over a local co connection such as a bus. So remotely attaching to file systems. So NFS and CIFS are common protocols. So NFS, the protocol or it is called the network file system, it is used for remote file access, remote file system mounting and others by the NFS file system while the cifs common internet file system 
So that's why it's called CIFS, the Windows Network File System now used on many systems. And then implemented via remote procedure calls or RPCs between host and storage over typically TCP or UDP on IP network. So SCSI, or as I've already mentioned, ICE SCSI protocol uses IP network to carry the SCSI protocol. So iSCSI, the protocol used to communicate with SCSI devices. So SCSI or SCSI is the small computer system interface. So NAS, as it said, it is connected in uh, over a network. So this is a NAS and then we have client that is accessing the LAN or the WAN. Okay, next is we have cloud storage. Okay, for cloud storage, similar to NAS, provides access to storage across a network. So unlike NAS, access over the internet or a one to remote data center. So NAS presented as just another file system, while cloud storage is API based or uh, uh, application program interface based with programs using the APIs to provide access. Examples include Dropbox, Amazon S3, Microsoft OneDrive, and Apple iCloud. So use APIs because of latency and failure scenarios. So NAS protocols wouldn't work well for these scenarios. Okay, next is we have storage array. So can just attach disks or array of disks. Avoids the NAS drawback of using network bandwidth. So storage array has controllers, provides features to attach host, supports to connect host to array, memory controlling software, sometimes NVRAM and others, a few to thousands of disks, RAID, hot spares, hot swap, which is to be discussed later on this um, slideshow presentation. And then for storage array, they have this shared storage, so more efficient. So features found in some file systems, we have snapshots, clones, thin provisioning, replication, deduplication, and others. So first for the storage array is we have the storage area network. So common in large storage environments. So multiple hosts attached to multiple storage arrays, which the effect is flexible. So our storage area network, they have their own storage array connected. And then for client to access where the SAN is, they should have to be connected to a common server. So this LAN and one can also be connected through SAN through data processing center and web content provider. So SAN is one or more storage arrays. Okay. So connected to one or more fiber channel switches or InfiniBand or IB network. So what is InfiniBand? So special purpose bus architecture that provides hardware and software support for high-speed interconnection and networks for servers and storage units. So host also attached to the switches. So storage made available via loon masking. So loon masking, so the meaning of loon is logical unit number masking from specific arrays to specific servers. So um, loon masking um, in, in, in an easy term, so it means that this um, storage will be visible to a particular server but it will not be in, it, it will not be visible to another server that is the loan masking next is easy to re add or remove storage add new host and allocate the storage so why have separate storage networks and communication networks because sun also uses bandwidth so consider iSCSI or the fcoe so what is fcoe fiber channel over ethernet a computer network technology that encapsulates fiber channel frames over Ethernet networks. Okay, another uh, storage array is we have the RAID structure. So RAID 
So, redundant array of inexpensive. So, sometimes it is inexpensive for this um, presentation. But in other books, uh, independent disks. So, multiple disk drives provide reliability via redundancy. So, that's why redundant array. So, increases the mean time to failure or MTTF. So, what is MTTF? So, a maintenance metric that measures the average amount of time a non-repairable asset operates before it uh, fails. So, we also have another definition, mean time to repair, exposure time when another failure could cause data loss. Next, next is we have mean time to data loss or based on above factors, the mean time to repair and mean time to failure. So, we have an example here. So, if mirror disks fail independently, consider disk with 100,000 mean time to failure and 10 are mean time to repair. So, mean time to data loss is we have 100,000 squared divided by 2. Where do you get the value of 2? Since mirror disk, meaning it is composed of 2 disks, so we have 2 times 10. So, 10 is 10 hours mean to repair is equal to 500 times 10 raised to 6 hours or 57,000 years. That will be the mean time to data loss. So, meaning after 57,000 years, so the data that is stored in, uh, uh, in, in a disk will be, of course, unusable or lost. So, frequently combined with NVRAM, to improve write performance. So NVRAM is what? This is a DRAM with battery or other backup power, rendering it as non-volatile. So several improvements in disk use techniques involves the use of multiple disks working cooperatively. So we have the so-called disk striping uses a group of disks as one storage unit. For example, you have one disk. If you're going to use um, RAID. So, for example, your disk divided into four and then these partitions or stripes or uh, divisions of your disk stripes will be um, stored. For example, the first stripe is to the first disk, second to the second, second stripe to the second disk, so on and so forth. So, that is what you call disk striping. So, RAID is arranged into six different levels. So, RAID schemes improve performance and improve the reliability of the storage system by storing redundant data. So, we have mirroring or shadowing or the RAID 1 keeps duplicate of each disk. And then, stripe mirrors, we have it's either RAID 1 plus 0 or mirrored stripes, RAID 0 plus 1, provides high performance and high reliability. So, we're going to discuss the difference between RAID 1 plus 0 and RAID 0 plus 1. Next is we have block interleave parity. So RAID 4, 5, and 6 uses much less redundancy. Okay, next is we have um, RAID with a storage array can still fail if the array fails. So automatic replication of the data between arrays is common. So frequently, a small number of hot spare disks are left unallocated, automatically replacing a failed disk and having data rebuilt onto them. So what is hot spare? An unused storage device ready to be used to recover data, such as in a RAID set. So hot spare, it's like you have a standby mode hard drive. And uh, if the, the RAID disk fails, and then you have a fail safe operation in which you have a hot spare disks. Okay, next is we have the RAID levels. So as I've said, so, RAID 0 is non-redundant striping. So, meaning your, for example, your hard drive, if you want it to do with RAID 0, so, and the, for example, you divide the hard drives into stripes, and then you store the stripe 1, 2, 3, and 4, and this is the backup, actually, of your whole computer system. So, next one is we have RAID 1 mirror disk. So, this is the stripe um, disk. And then since it's 4, you will replicate it. So that's why there is a C. So meaning you already have 8 disks. 
Next is we have raid number four is block interleave parity. So we have this uh, this stripe and then we have another fifth disk which is only uh, solely used for uh, parity for checking errors uh, for the uh, disks. And then next is we have RAID 5, block interleave distributed parity. So instead of using one hard drive dedicated for parity, so this is, this is distributed to the uh, spread. It is well distributed in the in the RAID implementation. Next is we have the RAID 6 peak plus Q redundancy. So aside from the parity, we have another which is Q. So this is to strengthen um, security if ever one of the disks uh, fails. And then last but not the least is we have the multidimensional RAID 6. So we have this uh, four disk and then a corresponding um, parity uh, P and Q. And then also for since it's a multidimensional, there is also uh, error correction for P and Q for this. Um, row, uh, this is the row and this is the column. Okay, next is we have the RAID 0 plus 1 and RAID uh, 1 plus 0. So we have here a illustration of RAID 0 plus 1 with a single disk failure. So how does RAID 0 plus 1 happens? So again, we have stripes. Okay, for example, four stripes, and this four stripe is mirrored. So that's the meaning of zero plus one. That's why um, stripe mirrors and then mirrored stripes. Okay, so for rate zero plus one, so stripes first and then mirrored. Okay, next is we have rate one plus zero. So, for example, you have this hard disk drive or storage array rather. And then um, you're going to have this um, copy. Uh, this corresponding array has its own mirror. And then this uh, also has the, its own mirror. So, that is the RAID 1 plus 0 with single disk failure. So, we have an X here meaning it has a failure. So, RAID 1 plus 0, so letter B, has some theoretical advantages over RAID 0 plus 1 which is letter A. So, an entire stripe is inaccessible leaving only the other stripe. With a failure in RAID 1 plus 0, a single drive is unavailable but the drive that mirrors is still available are all the rest of the drive. So, it has more advantage, the RAID 1 plus 0. Okay, next is we have other features. So, regardless of where RAID implemented, other useful features can be added, such as we have the snapshot. It is a view of a file system before a set of changes takes place, such as at a point in time. So, this will be discussed more in Chapter 12. And then replication is automatic duplication of writes between separate sites. So for redundancy and disaster recovery, it can be synchronous or asynchronous. Then hot spare disk is unused, automatically used by RAID production if a disk fails to replace the failed disk and rebuild the RAID set if possible. So this decreases mean time to repair. So since you have already a spare, you're just going to switch the control going to the hot spare disk. Okay, next is we have extensions. So RAID alone does not prevent or detect data corruption or other errors, just disk failures. So Solaris ZFS add checksums of all data and metadata. So checksums kept with pointer to object to detect if object is the right one and whether it changed. Can detect and correct data and metadata corruption. So ZFS also removes volumes partitions. So disks are allocated in pools. And then file systems with a pool share that pool uh, use the release space like malloc or memory allocation and free, mem uh, free for memory allocate or release calls. 
So we have this ZFS checksums on metadata and data. As it is said, it has a pointer to the object. Okay, this is an illustration of traditional and pooled storage. So for, for the file system, so the traditional volume, for example, we have the file system. It has its own volume in a set of um, disks. And then for ZFS and pooled storage, so we have three file system, and then they're connected in the storage pool. And this storage pool... Um, uh, this the hard disk drives are also connected to the storage pool. Not unlike with letter A, this particular file system uh, is assigned for a particular hard disk drive. But for ZFS, um, the, the file system can use as many disks uh, uh, if permitted. Okay, next is we have the object storage. So general purpose computing. File systems not sufficient for very large scale. So another approach is start with a storage pool and place objects in it. So object just a container of data. So no way to navigate the pool to find objects. So no directory structures and few services. Computer oriented, not user oriented. So the typical sequence, create an object within the pool, receive an object ID, access object via the, that ID and delete object via that ID. So object storage management software like the Hadoop file system or the HDFS and Ceph determine where to store objects and manages protection. So Hadoop file system is um, a brand of object storage management and also Ceph. So typically, by storing n copies across n systems in the object storage cluster. So Hadoop became popular because of big data. So this um, object storage management software are horizontally scalable, meaning refers to systems whose capacity and throughput are increased by adding additional loads. And this object storage management software are content addressable but unstructured. So, this is the end for chapter 11. So, I'll be providing another example to show how to do the disk scheduling algorithms, particularly um, FCFS, scan and C-scan. So, this, are used, uh, this is illustrated because these are the most commonly used disk algorithms um, as of date. So, I hope that you've learned something from this lesson all about the mass storage systems so how is the implementation of this mass storage so if you do have any questions so please please feel free to comment below and then please don't forget to subscribe to my channel so again thank you very much good day and stay safe